who are joined with us. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Reverend Sharp. To Reverend Al. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me say I think that this is a very important panel because we deal a lot in the civil work and not enough emphasis on the economics. And unless we bring home the economic empowerment, then our social and political work is compromised. And uh, one of the things we've been doing in the National Action Network is working, and Reverend uh, David Jefferson is here on our board, working very hard around the question of pension funds. When we look at the fact that many of our cities, our major corporations that we buy from, even our unions, do not use black money managers. They use the consultants who bring in their friends. Their friends give the money to them that comes out of our pension funds. So in many cases, grandma's pensions is being invested with developers that use that to remove grandma. We are really financing our own gentrification. And we've got to really do the connection between politics and economics, otherwise we are just recycling civil servants and not building empowerment. Mm. And that is why I think no one has tried to express this and represent this better than Senator Cory Booker. <laughs> Martin Luther King said that after he had fought uh, to integrate lunch counters and hotels, and then found out we couldn't afford the hamburger or the hotel room. <laughs> now we should be at the stage 50 years later where we're owning the hotels. Well, that's development money, and that comes from investments. And with these enterprise zones, and what Corey is trying to do, which is where I think he symbolizes what politics is about today, is bringing that marriage together. And some will say, well, that's too business oriented. That's what politics is about, protecting business interest. <laughs> and I think that if we don't get into the mentality of that, we will always be beggars calling ourselves senators or council people when we're really at the mercy of those that have the money. So as you listen to this panel, and you have some of the best uh, minds that have done this, Corey uh, does this, breathes this, lives this. Uh, mayor Ross Morocco is my mayor. He doesn't know I got a little kitchenette over in Newark he don't know about. <laughs> They've done this, and I think that this is a great, 
great need for us to put all the way through this caucus weekend to think how we use these enterprise zones and use the concept of having the marriage of politics with economics. You can't, I had my daughter with me and she was, got married last year. I told her romance without finance is nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> she said, my fiancé has a PhD. I said, Tom bring his W-2 for her. <laughs> so that is what this is about. Senator Booker, thank <laughs> you, and let us get on with the show. All right. All right. Can, can, every, can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear me? Say amen. 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 All right. I, I'm, I want to be brief because I want to get to the panel, but you have to understand. Um, when, I, when I was a mayor, uh, and, and now as a United States Senator, uh, I, I can make this call any time of day or night. Uh, and I just want to feel grateful that the Reverend Al Sharpton answers my call and gives me straight talk. And, and, and to have that kind of ally and that kind of friend who is focused on the issues of our communities, who has never left our communities, who's there when our communities need them, that is very, very critical. And so he has been steadfast now. He is still a young leader. Uh, but we all give him a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> he's still a young leader. He, he's got, he's got a, about two more, a little more, few more decades to put in until he becomes a statesman like Charlie Rangel. Another decade or two. Um, so look, this, this gathering is going to be a little technocratic. And I say that because uh, we have to understand that there are some technical things going on in our communities. That, that I said this in the earlier panel in this very same room, that we're by design to create pockets of poverty throughout our country. You have to remember, federal laws matter. And when we started seeing things like FHA loans, uh, uh, the public housing authority practices, redlining, how the finance industry, banking industry, housing industry, the federal government worked to create pockets of poverty, deep pockets of poverty. You, you have to understand that we have to start thinking constructively about our communities because economic changes continue to happen. And the headwinds are working against Americans as a whole, but African American communities in particular. The black-white wealth gap in America is worse. It has not been this bad since about 1972. In other words, years of making gains, we are now losing ground and not gaining it. And the trends in our economy continue to work against working Americans. Think about this. If you were working a full-time job being paid minimum wage back in my dad's generation, you are above the poverty line. But now you work a full-time job in this generation, at, at, at the minimum wage, you are below the poverty line. There's not a county in America, not one county, that you could work a full-time job at minimum wage and a four to two bedroom apartment. Exactly. And more than that, we see the ability for people who are working class and struggling to make it out of poverty has gotten worse over the years. If, if you are a baby boomer in this room, 90% of baby boomers did better than their parents. I was raised that way. Every generation does better than the one before. But that story in America is over. For, for millennials in this country, it's only about 50% doing better than, than, than their parents were. And that number is geographically, not diverse, but geographically isolated. In other words, of the 3,400 or so counties in America, only about 1,000 of them are seeing economic prosperity. But there's entire areas of our country that are being walled off and shut off still from economic opportunity. And, and so you are seeing this in all across America right now. As communities start to come back, as cities start to come back, what is happening to indigenous communities that for a long time have been looking for opportunity to being squeezed out and priced out and pushed out of their communities? And then often having to pay more. The housing prices are going out, so they move further away. Everything is going up but wages. We're at a 65-year low in America for wages, 80-year high in corporate profits. But you're now seeing people being moved away from work, so now they're having to pay commuting fares, childcare, and more. So what we tried to do, when I came down to Washington, D.C., I said, we're here really for two reasons. One is to expand economic opportunity, and two is to focus on issues of justice, which are related, criminal justice, environmental justice. That we have got to be, get back to a community where every American, 
has an opportunity to thrive because genius, the most valuable natural resource in a global knowledge-based economy is not oil, gas, or coal. It's the genius of our children. It's the genius, the human power. It's equally distributed. As many geniuses being born in Newark, New Jersey, as there are in wealthier suburbs. And so this is what this conversation is about today. It is about trying to make sure we are doing legislation at the federal level that empowers local people to begin to design rules so that more people succeed, that we expand more opportunity. And, and I'm pleased, and everybody here will be announced, and I'm about to shoot it back to, the, to our moderator, but I just want to give an example of this with the gentleman that's sitting to my left, to your right of me, which is my mayor, Roz Baraka. Now, if, if Roz ain't anything, he is consistent, <laughs> okay? <laughs> If you, know, if you know Mayor Baraka, he is consistent. He, he called the question years ago when he first ran for mayor as a 25-year-old young man. He says, we're maybe having a renaissance. So we don't see gentrification in our city. You drive by the construction strike. You see folk from the neighborhood that you know. When the building is finished and you go into that building, you see people working there that you know. When the financing is done and the bankers are sitting around on the table, you walk to that, that boardroom that is being negotiated around and you see people you know. That you know that our unions, which aren't always, have not always been diverse, mm -hmm. Can I get an amen? Yeah. That you make sure that those apprenticeship programs, that, that there are kids from the community getting apprenticeship programs. And so, and so what I'm excited about this panel in general, but, it's, but with my mayor in particular, because he's trying to give a master's class for how this should be done. And so the final point is this. What, 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 what the overarching theme of this conversation is a bill that I got attached uh, with the help of, of, of brother Tim Scott, He's a Republican uh, a senator from South Carolina, African-American man, who he and I may disagree on a lot of things. Please don't vilify the brother just because he's a Republican. You hear me now? Because a lot of people make a lot of assumptions just because of some kind of party label that we have on ourselves and not sitting down at a table looking for common ground that we need to get things done. And so, and so please applaud that. Tim Scott grew up to a single mother. He, he knows, he, he, he hasn't forgotten where he's can't come from. And, and, and so he and I sat down and said, how can we create some legislation that can, that can begin to create opportunity in our communities? And one thing I found out with, when I was mayor of Newark is that if you create better, different tax treatment, you can get people that want, suddenly want to invest in your community. So here's a little bit of technical, and let me explain a little more. What we did on the legislation that Tim Scott and Cory Booker got into the tax legislation as we said this, that if you, every governor in America gets to designate 20% of their high poverty areas as opportunity zones. Those zones that the governor's created are on average, a third of the population in those zones is below the poverty line. Or around a third of the population is below the poverty line. That's the average one. These are places that are not seeing investment. This is not where the Silicon Valley folks are coming to invest where the venture capitalists come to invest. And you remember, venture capital money, about only 1% of it has been going to, to, to less than 1% to people of color, to women uh, um, uh, uh, in general. And so what we did is the 20% of governor gets to designate, and then what happens, and there's some investors in this room, African-American investors in this room, that if you invest your capital in those zones, that you not only get a 15% discount over time on the uh, capital gains obligations that you have, but when you invest in those zones for the profits you make, you pay no, no capital gains whatsoever. And so that is going to create, mark my words, a lot of folks have already called it this, the biggest economic development program this country has seen in more than one generation. In other words, it's going to make people, whether they're a big fancy bank or someone who was a real estate investor, understand, wait a minute, if I now invest in, in Newark, New Jersey, or Camden, New Jersey, or rural places as well, 
that I can now invest in those areas, partner with people that are local, uh, partner with local leaders, make investments in those areas, and then the profit that made, I, I have a better deal than I can get investing in the high income, high net worth areas that seem to get all the investment. And then the critical part of this is the local partners that control this, that get to make the rules, and, and, and I know people on this, on this uh, panel will talk about this to make sure that we are included in those investings, that we are included in those jobs, that we are included in those opportunities. It's not going to happen automatically. We have to make it happen. And, and that's the thing. Most people, I said this in another panel, Alice Walker said the most common way people give up their power is not realizing they have it in the first place. We have so much more power than we're exercising. We're not exercising our power at the ballot box. Black women are, are setting a, a pace in this country by voting at upwards of 60%. Hold on. I want to applaud for black women, but 60% that our ancestors just die? That 40% of people just sit on the sidelines? Imagine if we, our, our participation rates got up to 80%, 90%. Transformational things would happen. And it's the same thing with our economic capital, economic power, the dollars that we have. That's why the, the Reverend Al and I have been partnering on pension funds. That's the greatest wealth that we create in this country. But there's not a diversity in investment in those funds. So we, this, is a, this is going to be maybe a little technical panel, but it's going to empower folks in this room, I hope, with some of the knowledge to not only know what's going on, but for themselves to better be participants in what's happening. Because if you do not have a seat at the table, you will be on the menu. All right, with that, I'm turning it back over to the moderator. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you, Senator. Good afternoon, I am Christopher Coase. I am Vice President at Smart Growth America and Director of Locus, which is a national network of responsible real estate developers and investors. And I'm really excited to really join this all-star panel. But first and foremost, I want to introduce the folks that I believe will give you some of the best insights on how to take what Senator Booker and Senator Tim Scott really put into motion and bring it back to your community to make sure that you are capitalizing on the opportunity zones by building businesses, by revitalizing your communities, as well as ensuring that we are building black wealth. We are at the CBC, so I can say that. We are trying to build black wealth. So my hope is we have an all-star panel. I'm going to introduce them really quickly. I know we're short on time, so I'm really going to do a round robin of questions. So first, I want to introduce all the way from New York City, Denise Scott, Executive Vice President for Alyssa. Let's give her a round of applause for being here. Next up, we have a dear friend of mine, Dr. Jermaine smith Ball, who is the President and CEO of Broward County Urban League. <laughs> Next, we have Lisa Hall, who is Senior Fellow at the Becker Center at Georgetown University. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Next up, is, is, I actually have to say this. This is my Christian sister right here. So I, she gave me a word this morning. I really appreciate it. So I just say that off the bat. But first of all, uh, Ms. Shaleen, uh, Executive Vice President at the RJ, oh, RWJ of Barabbas uh, Health. Sorry, I had to mess, mess that up. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we know Senator Booker. So we'll give another round of applause there. <laughs> all the way from New York, New Jersey, Mayor Baraka. Woo! Of course, all the way from Stockton, California, Mayor Tubbs. Yes. Last but not least, a true sister, Aisha Glover, uh, Vice President at the, uh, President and CEO of the New York Community Economic Development Corporation. Thank you for coming. Now, as I said before, there are a lot of questions about Opportunity Zones. Now, by a show of hands, how many people are familiar with Opportunity Zones? Oh, wow, good. A good number. All right. Let's do a quick poll. So you now know who's on the panel. Let's figure out who's in the room. How many people are elected officials in the room? Just show of hands. Okay. How many people are in the private sector, consider themselves an investor, entrepreneur? Or, okay. Oh, good. Wow. Good. All right. How many people are in the nonprofit space? You're on the front lines. You're an organizer. Okay. How many people work for uh, municipal government? Okay. Anyone who work on Capitol Hill? All right, that was a teaser. All right, great. Now, uh, Paolo, you know who's in the room. And one of the biggest questions I'm hearing across the country when it comes to Opportunity Zones is what are we supposed to be doing right now? And specifically, uh, um, Senator Booker, you mentioned Mayor Baraka was one of the leaders that you feel has been on the forefront of this. So I'm going to turn the first question to Mayor Baraka. What are you doing as a mayor right now to leverage the Opportunity Zones to make it a benefit for your community? Well, uh, first, I just want to thank the Senator for having this panel. 
I'm, and I'm excited to sit by one of my inspirations, yes. Mayor Tubbs here uh, from Stockton. Definitely, he don't know that, but I follow him all the time. Doing great work, but um, you know, in, in, in Newark, in New Jersey, first thing we did is begin to identify the places mm -hmm. that we think uh, would benefit from this and uh, begin to engage the governor's office around making sure NCDC, Aisha Glover is here, make sure that we uh, have the right places that we think can benefit from Opportunity Zone uh, influx of, the, of this kind of money. Areas that are, one, are on a cusp of development now, that are in key areas of the city around transportation, around industry, around those kind of things that we can get a maximum amount of benefit from, uh, create the maximum amount of jobs, uh, develop neighborhoods that are, that are on the, uh, you know, the cusps of, of something happening, but has not had the infusion of cash that they need to do it. And we begin to uh, look at areas that there has been no development in for the past 50 years, right, since, you know, World War II. There's been any real development in that area. Uh, and so those are the two uh, basic uh, places that we've identified in the city mm -hmm. and begin to uh, put land together, uh, you know, put, put industry and different things together, begin to focus that to make sure when, when this stuff happens, and uh, also important is we begin to talk to uh, people who potentially can invest in these areas mm -hmm. to get them interested uh, in doing that uh, and, and, and interfacing with, with those groups to make sure that when, it, when this does happen, that there's a seamless kind of way uh, for them to begin to invest in communities and projects that are already taking place. Well, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, so now that was the East Coast version. So Mayor Tubbs, what's the West Coast version of this? <laughs> More of the same, really. Um, but first, let me thank you, Senator Booker, and for all the panelists. Um, we've been working very closely with PolicyLink because, especially in California, there's a lot of investment opportunity, but with that comes a, a fear of displacement. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to make sure when money comes, that my people don't have to leave when, when the good things happen, that the folks who are eating at liquor stores can enjoy the Trader Joe's if slash when it comes. So we're working with PolicyLink <laughs> to figure out sort of what's some of the rules or local policies and practices we can put in place and sort of how do we measure success? Is success just having a building? Is success just having an investment? Are there things we can do to look at how many jobs are created, how many affordable units are created, et cetera, and, and talk to the investment community in that way? Um, the second thing we've been doing is spending a lot of time um, with VC folks and the governor's office and everyone because as the senator mentioned, this is so new, mm -hmm. no one really knows what they're doing. <laughs> so, so we're spending all our time learning and learning and learning and get, being in conversations and figuring out. And I think because it is so new, it gives us a very, very special opportunity to kind of shape what it is. Because it it's, it's not anything yet. We're still waiting, waiting for the IRS, for example, to tell us exactly how to create an opportunity fund. Um, the third thing we've been doing is we put together, much like the city of Newark, an investment perspective mm -hmm. that identifies what are the city's priorities in terms of where we want to see investment, where are some products we have online with an emphasis on projects that are at least workforce or affordable, but also some under, underdeveloped and utilized areas. And the last thing we've been doing is figuring out sort of, because the development side I think is easier to understand, like you put money in, you build something, we get it, but in terms of the, the credits folks get for investing in startups and businesses mm -hmm. and opportunity zones, um, that's something we're really interested in figuring out how to attack. We don't have any answers yet, but every day we're in conversation trying to figure out how to do it. And then the last thing is, We've been lobbying our governor to create some sort of fund so that cities could have the technical expertise mm. to do this. Because I'm, I don't, I'm not a hedge fund guy. I'm not a VC <laughs> guy. Yeah, yeah. Right. Not, I'm not an economic development wizard. I'm just a mayor. Um, so we need a subject matter expert who spend all their time figuring this out. And I do think if we do this right, it will create the city that that the folks in my community deserve. So I'm going to thank you, Senator Booker and Senator Scott, um, for the legislation. But I also want to piggyback on what you said in terms of. It's not just going to happen. We have to be deliberate, we have to be strategic, we have to shape it, because if we don't, we'll get more of the same and people will just get richer um, displacing folks. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Now, I think that's a really good segue because a lot of times we've heard about the Opportunity Zones as a means to do real estate deals. But as Senator Booker pointed out, this is more than just rehabbing buildings. And I didn't want to go to Micheline. You are really, really trying to figure this out right now in New Jersey. How are you and your, uh, your company approaching this beyond just real estate deals? Oh, yes. Yeah. 
we are going to pass the mic because we are in here talking about passing the plate in order to make a more equitable future. So that is all right. Can I get an amen? amen. amen. All right. He already warned you. So um, I have the, the fortunate blessing and gift of, yes, um, I'm an executive vice president with the state's largest academic medical center system, but that is in a state that has uh, Senator Cory Booker as its senator and then Mayor Baraka as our mayor in the city of Newark, right? So it is all of God's intention coming together at one time. Okay, that's enough of the Christian ease. But what I will say to you is, listen, that is a fact. Um, so we are literally doing two things. One, we treat nearly um, over Jersey's nearly 9 million residents. And so it gives us an opportunity as a $6 billion entity to, to really be that much more intentional about how we do business, right? So we turn the focus inward, right, as we look upward in order to make certain that we are very intentional about who we hire. And so in that partnership with the mayor and his initiative around Newark 2020, right, we have said we will hire 350 residents of the city of Newark in order to make certain that they have livable, long-term, sustainable employment. But in in addition to that, where do we buy from, right? How are we procuring? And so we also adopted an anchor strategy, which is what a hospital is, right? How many of us have gone into a, a, a hospital in an urban setting and you see a difference when you walk through those glass doors? Anybody? Anybody? Right? Mm -hmm. um, so what we realize is that the proliferation of uh, the deterioration of that urban environment has actually been caused by our presence. Right? That we have contributed to that. So what we get is that if you are this large, then we also need to make certain that we are giving true opportunity to be more inclusive to small businesses, right? Because it's not just about building brick and mortar, but also that small business community, which was our, our true intent of this legislation. So we are also not just giving them a chance to vend, but investing in them in real time, right? So giving $5 million over five years to um, New York Venture Partner Labs, but then doing more than that, Work, working with entrepreneurs entrepreneurs in order to give them real opportunity, vending with them, partnering with Newark uh, ECDC, with, with Aisha, and then Rutgers University to build them and have an opportunity to have building uh, sustainable growth around how to vend with us one hospital at a time until they get to all 16, right? So those are just some of the beginnings of what we have thought about and how we're thinking about this. But we've also partnered with our beloved friends at LISC. And so we are also in the middle of a South Ward Retail Quarter Investment Program. And there's a little hush-hush talk about <laughs> an even larger fund that we're trying to breathe into reality so that this city gets what it has always really been ripe for. But now more than ever, I think it's important that we have a mayor right now who is also the son of an individual who was the voice of the Newark riots, right? Because it has influenced the way in which corporations, corporate entities, get to even think about how we begin to really work together in a collaborative method. Amen. Now, I want to follow that up with uh, Denise. Let's have, hey, guys, Denise, Liz came out for the past uh, couple of months announcing these major aggregation of funds for Opportunity uh, Zone. So you guys are kind of like right on the front lines. Can you talk about what are you guys doing? I can, and um, Senator, let me start by thanking you for your leadership and thanks to Senator Scott as well. Right now, as a community development finance institution, we're the largest in the country, we're placing about a billion dollars in communities across the country, including in rural communities. The total community development industry using low-income housing tax credits, new market tax credits, is probably together, um, that represents about around, say, $20 billion. Opportunity zones is game-changing. We're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars. That's a total different perspective. And in that context, and everybody can participate, that's what makes this so important. It's not just the banks for CRA, or it's everybody. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, what we're trying to do is to deliver that message and to deliver the message that, to explain it across the country, across the different sectors, the business sector. We want to see MWBEs and minority businesses with full participation. About 1.6 um, million um, businesses are in the designated OZs. And so that's an opportunity to get to them and figure out how to drive capital into those small businesses. The senator mentioned rural communities. There are over 2,000 rural communities that are in the designated zones. We want to figure out how to drive capital there as well. So really, what we're really doing now is talking to the philanthropic community, to do donor advisory funds. We're talking to the business sector, to um, high net worth individuals. And we're saying several things. One, we can help 
you figure out like what makes the most sense for how you put your capital into deals because this is what we've been doing for the last 40 years. We celebrate our 40th year in just a few months. And so we can explain that. We can also help you think about the fact that it's really important, as the senator said, as, as the mayor said, that we're really talking about equitable development. The empowerment, the opportunity zone legislation doesn't, it's, it's an opportunity and it is also the challenge. The challenge mm -hmm. is that because it's very flexible, that's the opportunity, is that some people might decide, well, I really don't want to do this equitable thing. I just want to get the benefit of the tax benefit. So, so part of what we're doing is going around and sending this message. This is really about, as, as was stated, we want to see development in communities. We want to see investment in communities. Here are the different ways you can do that without displacing people. In fact, going further than not just not displacing people, but providing that benefit. So, so what we will be doing over the course of time is also assembling other forms of capital. And many of the deals that will benefit from Opportunity Zone money, other money will also be needed. Mm -hmm. And so some of the time that we're, we're putting effort and energy into identifying other buckets of money. Um, we can, for example, as mayors start to think about land that could be designated um, that's in the Opportunity Zone that's looking um, for some opportunity to benefit from the, um, from the OZ uh, investment, we might start buying up that land right now, for example, get it ready. Maybe we can make uh, pre-development loans to um, businesses. What's really important for small businesses is, is that we can find a way to advance equity so that they don't have to dilute their cash in order to participate. So there are a number of, of ways that we're looking at how we can jumpstart the process put the infrastructure in place, support local government in ways that, that they need, as the mayor said, looking for the technical expertise. People like us can provide that technical expertise. Mm -hmm. So we now have the private investor. Now I'm curious, Aisha, as head of uh, oh, the New Community Economic Development Corporation, how are you approaching this, and particularly from the lens of you have public money, how are you ensuring that when you go out and seek partnerships with private sector, how are you ensuring that those investments at the end of the day are not pushing out the residents that are, being, that are in those communities? Sure, sure. And uh, of course, I'd like to also start by thanking, thanking the senator. Um, I think the, the, the trick of that or the intention behind that, the mayor kind of touched on, um, we were very intentional. We kind of keep hearing that word throughout all of these workshops. And I think it's important for us to make sure that we're thinking about that from the economic development lens. Um, we were very intentional in the areas that were chosen um, with a particular focus on neighborhood corridors, um, within industrial areas, thinking about the types of jobs that would be coming and concentrated in those areas uh, in terms of being a pathway to the middle class. So really looking at it first from the, uh, the particular areas and then the opportunities for uh, entrepreneurs and small businesses to benefit from that and be engaged uh, in the conversations as well. So we're providing that technical expert expertise to uh, small business owners and entrepreneurs, and we're being very strategic about how we're doing that matching between uh, investors and real estate developers. Now, I want to follow that up with uh, 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 Lisa. So you are actually involved with crafting this legislation. And one of the things I, we had this conversation a couple of days ago, you said to me, Christopher, this is not just about you know, re revitalizing buildings, revitalizing corridors, but we should be thinking much broader. It's not about, you know, we got new minimal wage jobs. We're actually talking about how can we create more black by wealth, more black businesses. So I'm really curious, can you talk more about how can we get more people of color actually not only formulating these opportunity funds, but also taking the full benefit of that? Yeah. So I, I like to keep my words simple, and folks probably know the acronym KISS, KISS. <laughs> uh, I want to apply it to a different set of phrases. So K, keep your eyes open. I, invest. And S, shine a light. So on the K, keep, keep your eyes open. These zones are our communities. So we heard a couple of stats thrown out there. What we didn't hear is that more than two thirds of these communities are minorities, exactly. right? These are our communities. And if we don't keep our eyes open, ask questions, share information, 
work with our community development partners, then we are quickly going to see folks who don't look like us coming into these communities, realizing their capital gains, and not paying any taxes on it. Mm -hmm. So first, I would say keep our eyes open. The second is invest. And several people raised their hands and said they were investors in this room. And there are ways to invest in opportunity funds with very small amounts and very large amounts. Already there's been a fund announced called Fund Rise, F-U-N-D-R-I-S-E, that is raising $500 million to invest in opportunity funds. And the way you get a voice is to actually be an investor. Mm -hmm. And so I would urge anyone with capital that they can put into investments to find the opportunity funds in your communities and invest locally. And the last piece is shine a light. So I, too, thank Senator Booker and thank Senator Scott for the great work that they did getting this legislation passed. But it is fair to say that what they envisioned in the original Investing in Opportunity Act is not what landed in the final tax jobs or tax cuts and jobs act of 2017. And so it set up the parameters for zones, but there is no transparency around reporting, which was part of the original vision. Now I also want to clarify, I didn't have anything to do with the original establishment of the, the uh, legislation, but I've been very involved making sure, trying to shine a light and get information out having community development organizations working together through a working group that the Beck Center has organized. And this shining a light thing is critical because investors can come into these communities. They don't have to tell you that they're there. All they have to do is self-certify to Treasury. There is no requirement for them to report to anyone, for there to be publications about who is investing in opportunity zones, through opportunity funds. So it is incumbent upon us and our communities to ask the questions when we see the developments emerging, to say, what are you doing around hiring, right? What are you doing about hiring the people who live in these communities? When we see investments coming in for things like hotels, right? Not just hiring for the service workers, but who's hiring to construct, right? Who's in the back office? So it's really important, I think, for us to shine a light on these activities as, if, as they begin to emerge in our communities. And I'll leave it there and just remind you to kiss. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, Lisa, you mentioned that this is a, a piece of legislation that made it very easy for people to create opportunity funds. And so one of the things that we learned recently is that all you have to do is fill out a form and attach it to your IRS, uh, your tax returns, and send it to IRS. And that's your opportunity fund. And so you're absolutely right. It's very flexible. But which, with that, I kind of want to go to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Bob. You've been working in your own community as a community development uh, organizer, investor. How are you now saying, hey, it's a flexible opportunity. You are doing a lot of servicing to small businesses. What opportunity has this created for you? Right. So once again, thanks to um, the senator for this chance to really talk about it. I want to recognize the fact that I do have some National Urban League staff in the room, as well as two colleagues uh, from the Urban League, one from Houston, one from Charlotte. The reason why I mention that is because the Urban Leagues, because like Lisk and, and others, do have affiliates around the United States, Vivian Cox Frazier in Newark, um, definitely says hello, by the way. Um, <laughs> We are uniquely positioned. Folks who uh, raise their hands, the community-based organizations, I really want to speak to you because I found myself in a situation of reading the legislation thinking, oh, that's in there. What are we going to do but not seeing any conversation in my local community about it? Now, clearly, are there conversations happening? Of course they are. But because I am very interested in the lived experience being at the table. So in this case, lived experiences, the residents that already live in these communities that were being designated and or the existing businesses that are in those communities um, that, again, being designated as opportunity zones. The question that I posed um, 
at my table, at our table, and I think it's a question for community-based ground level um, organizations, is how are you using your influence to bring that voice to the table? Because investors are gonna do what investors do. The market will follow this project. Whatever makes the most sense for the market, that's what will happen. So I think it's important for community-based organizations to do a couple of things, and these are the things that we have done. You can use your brand to convene. Bring people to the table to have conversations, whether it's your elected officials, your local elected officials, whether you partner with organizations who have the technical assistance and the understanding of opportunity zones. Bring your residents to the table. Bring your existing businesses to the table. Bring investors to the table. Bring your corporate sponsors and supporters to the table. Um, in our world, uh, we have very large um, health organizations to bring them to the table because they have the capital. So the thing that I would love to challenge our community-based organizations is to figure out how you're going to collaborate and bring that lived experience. The second thing I think is important is that we're going to have to figure out ways in which we are able to because the timelines are pretty aggressive, even though the rules are still you know, to be developed, the timelines on the, um, the Opportunity Zone funds and how they're to be deployed are very aggressive. So Newark has it all together, okay? New Jersey has it all together. Avenir has designated them as Opportunity Zones. So there again, another convening opportunity to bring those smaller cities to the table and help them understand what policies they need to put in place, the do no harm policies, et cetera, to help to retain that lived experience in the community. And last but certainly not least, where I think is gonna be really important is the aggregation of the talent. So there's going to be clearly aggregating shovel-ready projects that um, community-based organizations can be a part of. You need to figure out your revenue model in that, but that's a conversation for another day. But the last piece is aggregating the talent. Many people are going to have the opportunity to become wealthy as it relates to the opportunity zones and the things that come about with it. Real estate investors, fund managers, and so forth. So where I have been challenged when I've been talking to investors, they're like, where is the African American talent? Where is the Hispanic talent so that I can give or bring them on board to manage these funds that I'm going to do anyway? I'm doing this. So I think we also, as community-based organizations running training programs, job programs, access to young professionals and older professionals. Um, how do we connect them to the opportunity? So those are some of the things that we're doing in, in South Florida. And I'd love to challenge the conversation for our community-based organizations to collaborate around that. I, I just no, wanted to add, um, the rules have not been issued yet. So once they are, there is an opportunity at that point um, to work with Senator um, Booker and Scott to try to get the rules to at least address some of the concerns yeah. that we have about really this issue about making sure that we know what's going to be done, keeping data and records, reporting to the IRS, making sure they have a role. And governors and mayors really do have an opportunity to try to control some things as well. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're hopeful that at least at the rules stage we can influence some of what we're concerned about right now. Before I ask this last question, uh, if folks have questions, please start lining up in the center aisle and we'll get to you. I know there are a lot of questions about the Opportunity Zone, how they work, how investments are being driven. So, uh, so quietly, go to the, uh, we will be at mic soon. Um, for each of the panelists, I want, and I'm going to start with you, Senator Booker, since you were one of the key sponsors of this legislation. So, uh, you know, look, for me, so much of my, my entire professional career has been living in the, in the cent central ward and for a little bit in the south ward of Newark, but in, in historically African-American communities um, that have been, uh, as I said, by design, a disadvantage in terms of opportunity. And so, uh, honestly, for me, it, uh, it's opening my door and being able to see the impact. Now, already, thanks to Mayor Baraka, uh, who, who in many ways, like uh, Mayor Tubbs, who's, by the way, Mayor Tubbs has done some He's put so forth some incredibly revolutionary policy ideas, like guaranteed income, th some very interesting things. But the good thing I see about Mayor Barack already when I walk around my neighborhood uh, is from parks to supermarkets to things starting to happen in my community that are a sign. And, and when I go in those areas, like I went in my supermarket the other day, 
and all Newarkers are working up, up in there, which is really good. And so that's really my, my judge. Is, is, all, is this a piece of legislation that is truly as revolutionary as potential that begins to close the gap of opportunity that exists in this community? And, and I, I'll be able to see it with my own eyes uh, with the, because I know I have local leaders um, that are really focused on this and are trying to get it done the right way. But my, my hope, and I think the point that was made was really right, that there's a lot of states that are, are not as engaged in this. And that's why I, and Tim to his credit, have been going around the country trying to help uh, get people's awareness uh, to the opportunities that, that exist. Uh, but I'm hoping if we take back Congress um, uh, that we will have even more uh, opportunity uh, to get back to the work of making the American dream for real for every community. Well, uh, in New Jersey, and I've been looking at this data, you know, I, uh, Ryan Hager, you know, from New Jersey Institute of Social Justice harasses me every other day. Uh, you know, in New Jersey, the, the net median income of white families is $271,402, actually the highest uh, in the entire nation. The median net uh, worth for Latino families is $7,020. And the median net worth for black families is $5,900 in New Jersey. So, you know, this, this uh, is an a opportunity to kind of close that wealth gap in some, that's, that's incredible. It would take almost 200 or more years for our families to even catch up with the median net worth of white families in the state of New Jersey. So we, we, we look at this as an opportunity to try to fill that gap, to, to, to bring wealth into those communities that have been long ignored. And since the federal government is not going to do a Marshall Plan in our community, uh, the Opportunity Zones is uh, the next best thing that we have. And we are grateful that Senator Booker has uh, you know, created the kind of imagination to make these things happen. And we just have to use it now as a tool to begin to hammer away at that gap. And uh, you know, if we've done a little bit of that, I look at it as success. What's their definition of success? Well, 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 being hyper local, I think success for Stockton looks like three things. Um, number one, when I'm in conversations with folks about investing in the communities I come from, the opportunity zones, they can no longer tell me it doesn't pencil out. Because that's the excuse I get all the time. Well, I would love to, Mayor, but I won't make money. So that, number one. Um, number two, we're dealing with a housing crisis now in Stockton, so I'm hopeful that this Opportunity Zone legislation gives us the tools to make sure that people from all incomes can afford to live in Stockton, whether you're the mayor, whether you're the Uber driver, whether you're the bank president, that there's housing for, for you and there's enough affordable units for people to live in Stockton. And then number three, that the Opportunity Zone serves as a catalyst to really build up a sort of startup ecosystem in Stockton. We're only 70 miles away from the Bay Area an hour away from Sacramento, so it makes no sense that the same wealth we see created in Oakland and San Francisco, at least a sliver of that, um, should come down to Stockton. I think the Opportunity Zones will allow us to kind of make it so it makes sense for folks to invest or locate in Stockton and kind of build up the startup ecosystem there. So the second part of the act is, you know, it's Tax and Jobs Act. <laughs> so um, I think success looks like increase jobs and not just jobs, but making sure that local people are accessing them. And that, that, that was part of the thinking that went into where we were able to select the communities, uh, the, the specific census tracts. We we're trying to be very strategic about the types of jobs that would likely be sparked in those particular areas. Um, the mayor has a, a, a major initiative called Newark 2020, which is um, a, a push to all the anchors and corporations in the city to hire 2020 residents by the year 2020. Um, I have 100% confidence that we will get there. That's you know, less than two years away. Um, so in 10 years, I think kind of using New York 2020 as a model for local hiring is going to help us ensure that the opportunity zones are actually yielding us what the original goal was in the act. Um, so uh, I think of, of a few things. One, the fact that uh, I view this particular article of legislation as really a public health article of legislation, right? So um, yes, it's because I come from a healthcare background, but it is also because 
80% of healthcare outcomes are actually impacted by the social determinants of health, right? Yep. So where you live, where you work, how you eat, what you eat, having access to those things. And to me, this article of legislation is all of those good things wrapped into one, right? It is exactly that. So what success look like, looks like is an incredibly uh, more equitable future in 10 years, where we see, yes, this incredible job growth, this outrageous small business continuation, right? So we know that, that um, uh, more black women have been going into being entrepreneurs than any other group in this country. And so what we would love to be able to see is the fact that, yes, these small businesses are now mid-sized businesses because they have indeed turned around and done local hiring right, and training of these same individuals. And then, quite frankly, that these corporate entities like that from which I come are looking at this as really the asset that it is and not the deficit that our communities have always been called. Listen, Senator Booker mentioned Newark and Camden. So I get the glorious chance to work in Newark, right? But I'm a little brown girl from Camden. And for other folks, what you know is that's the most dangerous city in America because we're overachievers. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it looks for me like a case where we get to see the fact that the health outcomes, that healthcare disparities have been eliminated, not reduced, right? Because we get to say that understanding that we're in a city that has a Senator Booker and a Mayor Baraka and Aisha Glover and then corporate anchors who are working together in order to achieve that. So for me, success in 10 years look like, looks like we will be able to go in to brief President Booker, I'm so sorry, um, <laughs> I serve a great big God and nothing is impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe in the gift of prophecy. And we will be able to tell him. And we will be able to tell him about what our collective collaboration has been able to produce in his home city. Amen. So preach, preach. I think it is simple. This is a public benefit. Right? It is in the tax code. And it should not just benefit wealthy people. Right. Yes. It should benefit all US citizens. So success to me is that the people who already live in these communities, the people who work in these communities now, and the people who own small businesses in these communities benefit. That they are better off in 10 years than they are today. And that means things that have been pointed out, things around wage growth, things about employment, around the physical condition of the buildings, and that people are still in their homes and have been able to right. benefit from appreciation mm -hmm. of property in their communities that they own already. So for me, success is that the people who are there that look like us primarily have benefited. Okay. That long is pretty, that line is pretty long, so I know we want to get there, so mine is going to be short. Ditto to everything that um, all the panelists just said, and I will just add this one point. Success would look like each and every one of us in this room today doing something differently for what can be impactful 10 years from now. Because if we get all this information and do nothing with it, 10 years from now, it's going to look just like today. So let's do something with the information. I'll just say that um, we, we can close the opportunity gap, and that's what's really important, and jobs, uh, affordable housing, all of that is important. But if we can also start to build wealth in communities of color across right. this country, then to me that will also be success. Amen. Well, I'm going to take a moderator privilege here, and I'm going to sing, sing everyone's statements. I believe the call to action for 10 years is as something that Mayor Brocker, you said. If it's, it's 200 years to catch up, the 10 years from now, we should cut that in half. That's right. Amen. If it takes two, uh, 200 years to, cap, to close the wealth income gap that we have between people of color and whites, I hope that we can take that to at least 100 years. Heck, maybe be bolder. Maybe that 25 years. All right? That's our call to action today. Now, we're going to go to questions. Um, here's the deal. We have a lot of people in the line. So uh, the best, most efficient way of doing this, I know people may have soliloquies or ideas. So if you keep them to one minute, we're, one minute, <laughs> and we're going to do uh, three at a time. We're going to do three questions at a time and allow the uh, panelists to answer from there, OK? Please say where you're from, your name and where you're from. 
quick question for uh, Senator Booker, Ken Baker of the National Development Council. And just quickly, is there anything that your office or the collective Congress can do to push Treasury and IRS to get some guidance out, particularly when you're talking about investors who would care about more equitable investment in our communities? They're apprehensive to jump into the Opportunity Zone space absent any guidance from the federal right. government. So, so. We, we will get, uh, we will get uh, some guidance. Uh, Treasury is going to finish these rules, I, I think, in a matter of weeks. I, I do believe that they will be imperfect, and there will be things that Senator Scott and I are, and others are going to have to press to further make technical changes. But we are going to get some definitions to the questions I think you're concerned with from the IRS very, very soon. They're going to come out in a matter of weeks. Okay, okay. perfect. All right, thank you. So it, um, my name is Tamika Wren, and I am from possible. Please, thank you, sir. And again, I have my team here. So let's make sure we get this gentleman's information. Rashawn, okay. Good afternoon. Thank you, sir. Oh. Rashawn's right over there on the wall. Good afternoon, Sierra Jackson with NGP Van, uh, affectionately known as educating communities and individuals and incentivizing them to invest. Um, also, how can we corral human capital? Um, you know, the people who live in the communities, formerly incarcerated, the low-income people. Um, how do they become involved and and invest in these type of opportunity zones as well. And by the way, I, I had no idea that we were actually talking about a specific topic. I thought it was just opportunity in general. So I just Googled opportunity zones in North Carolina, and they've got this long list of tracts of land, but no specific information. So it's very, very cloudy. So for people like me or who, who want to become involved or who who just want to know how to how we empower individuals in our communities to, to, to take advantage of these types of opportunities, you know, it's, it's difficult. So we need to talk about educating people and how we do that. No, that's great. That's great. Now, as you want to say that um, in terms of resources, uh, there are two big groups I can recommend. The Economic Innovation Group, which was one of the major thought leaders behind this legislation. Literally just type in Economic Innovation Group in the web on Google. It will pop up and it will give you all the information you need about Opportunity Zones. As well, uh, my organization, locusdevelopers.org, has a map across the country that identifies the zones as well as where they are with transit, where are brownfield sites, as well as economic and demographic data. So those are just two resources immediately for you to get up to speed. And we'll... Economic Innovation Group, EIG.org, and the second one is LocusDevelopers.org. Now, one of the two questions that we had was one, as from the elected officials perspective, what can you what are you doing now to kind of go the extra mile to ensure that in these specific zones that you're putting in the do no harm policies or inspire the confidence, I think, what the women's really speaking to, in making sure that residents feel that as this uh, program matures, they're not getting pushed out. Is there something else that you're doing beyond the traditional policies that we've been using as of late? And I'll start with you, Mayor. Oh, thank you. Oh. Well, well, I think I said earlier, we're still figuring it out, right? This is all completely new. So what we've been doing is convening with experts who think about equity and policy all the time. So we spend a lot of time with Policy Link just really figuring out this is a great opportunity. How do we make sure we do no harm? And then I think we are also really blessed in that a lot of areas that are designated as opportunity zones are mostly commercial or industrial. So there's not folks living there. And the, the part of our opportunity zones in the city that have that is residential, it's, it's our downtown, and there's like a lot of room for that to grow because there's only about 200 people living in our downtown now. Um, so I think we've been lucky with designation in that, in that point. But I think to the point of the question, intentionality will, will have to be key because capital is going to do what capital does. That's right. um, and, and, and that's why we have elected officials and humans who say, okay, capital, you're not you're necessarily not good or bad, but let's put some guardrails in place. But as of right now, I'm not prepared to prescribe exactly what those guardrails are, but I can say that there has to be some, some, some things in place, and I think a lot of it is what we're trying to do is go lead in with our priorities. And I think a lot of the questions speak to, I think the, uh, the sister talked about how if you go on the websites, you see census tracts was very cloudy. And, and I think that, that that's a promise in, in, in peril, right? Because in that, in that ambiguity, then capital can do what it wants. And that's why I think what you hear from Mayor Baraka and myself is that we're trying to identify the projects we want to see. And usually when we talk to people, say, hey, these are the 10 parties for the city that have been vetted by residents and are aligned with our strategic goals and plans. Um, let's invest there first. I think doing so in that way will kind of ameliorate some of the adverse effects. Now, to the second question, how do we ensure, and I think this is one of the things I think Senator uh, Booker, I've heard you and Senator Scott say, this is not about Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan. 
This is about mom and dad who has that small business who may, hey, the kids may want to sell it, but they want to become investors in their community. So Lisa, since you are an expert on social impact investing, how do we go about ensuring that the full spectrum of investors, right, from the mom and pop to the institutional, actually can engage in this space? Yeah. So this may seem like a strange response, but I think we need to use our social media power. I, I really think that that is a way to get out the word on this. There is a hashtag already for Opportunity Zones that is being actively used. And a lot of the mainstream media, the Atlantic, uh, the Wall Street Journal, they've already done feature stories about Opportunity Zones. So you know who knows, right? Is the people who are reading those media publications. We need to make sure, you know, Richelieu's Dennis is here. We need to make sure they do a feature. You know, feature Angela Glover from Policy Link to talk about what's happening around equitable development. Have a feature story in Ebony. We need to get the word out through our own media, both social media, black Twitter, as well as print media. So I, it seems maybe like an odd answer to a question about investing. But I think we have a lot of leverage in that way. Technology changes the game on information flow. And just to that point of technology, if folks who don't know Fundrise, it is a crowdsourced financing program. And the way they actually started uh, before it became really big is that they actually allowed people to contribute $100 each, and they aggregated those dollars and actually invest in real estate deals. Now there are black-owned crowdsourced finance program. One particularly is called uh, uh, Buy the Block which is one that's uh, controlled by people of color that are doing this in opportunity zones. Churches can get together, associations can get together, unions can get together. We have the ecosystems in our community. The thing is, we should be leveraging technology as well to actually aggregate our resources. And I think someone said it in a previous panel, there's $1.2 trillion in purchasing power of people of color. There's no reason why we can't invest in our own communities. So with that, we're going to take these final three uh, uh, questions, and then we're going to wrap it up and have Senator Brooker give a close remarks, okay? okay. Thank you. Um, I'm glad we're talking about technology, because my name is Ruben Harris. I live in San Francisco. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Breaking Startups. My question is, how are you all engaging and educating the technology community about opportunity zones, given the fact that they're not just taking over industry, every industry, um, significantly contributing to job creation and hiring, but also um, contributing to gentrification, affordable housing crisis, like for a lot of the wage gap issues and things like that are just going to be important when it comes to um, making sure that they're involved. So I want to know what you guys are doing related to that. Hi, my name is Tori Collins, and I'm actually a resident of D.C. by way of Chicago, so I relocated here for um, work, and I work with the federal government. And so I currently live in Ward 6, and um, my question is, how on a grassroots level, because I belong to a, a grassroots organization within my community, because I, I realized coming into the community that it was a gentrified neighborhood. So how do we, um, on a grassroots level, work to ensure that the opportunity zones that have already been chosen by my particular mayor, um, who I love, by the way, um, are in Ward 7 and 8. And those are areas that were, that's the remaining areas of the Chocolate City, right? And so these are areas where people may be pushed out. So I know Liz has done a lot of work with the 11th Street bridge project. Um, and so I want to ensure that our council member, because we have our council member and our local um, uh, elected officials on speed dial so we can reach out to them whenever we want to, but we want to make sure that they're in placing equitable development plans. So how on a grassroots level can my organization help with that? Uh, thank you. I'm Beverly Moore. I want to thank you, Ms. I mean, uh, Senator Corey, for your comp contribution and having this uh, brain trust. As an elder in the room and a former Head Start director in the Kansas City region in Sergeant Shriver's War on Poverty, hmm. I am concerned about uh, monitoring, evaluating, and making sure that plans are done the way they were intended. I have witnessed people in certain areas of the Kansas City region, which is many states, as you know, like, you know, Nebraska, et cetera. And uh, the point is people divert funds to other places like a tractor or whatever they want to do. So my first question is how will your program ensure, like the lady said, New North Carolina was blurry, okay? I want to un understand how you ensure that 
My second question, as a member of, of a village in Columbia, Maryland, who allegedly was participating in a process to redo one of our 10 villages in Columbia, we participated in a focus group. I want to also understand how you will educate people in the community who do not have skill to understand what you're talking about. And we blindly participate in focus groups to redo our villages, which consist of a lot of money, some stores, some housing, et cetera. But people blindly communicate and participate in these forums are these focus groups, and we don't get necessarily what we want. So politicians know in advance of the focus group what is going to happen, but we as participants in the neighborhood don't necessarily. So that's two questions, but mostly it's based on honesty of the people who have the money mm -hmm. and the ability of the group to control from there, from the mayor on what really happens with the money. Thank you. I think that's a really good question. Thank you, bro. Now, so we're going to start with the three questions. One, how do we get the tech industry involved in this conversation? And Senator, you've been, you have been really interested in it. <laughs> um, uh, look, again, to me, it's all about making sure that the communities are involved. The tech money is going to look for the opportunity. Trust me, they're some of the most sophisticated, savvy investors. And when you tell them you can roll over your massive capital gains obligations mm -hmm. to get, you know, 15 point step up, you can get like a 15% break and then find a place to invest with no, that money is going to be looking for opportunity. And so I'm not worried about the tech money not, not taking advantage of this. Mm -hmm. What I'm worried about is making sure that the people that are at, at the helm in these communities, the nonprofit organizations, the uh, governmental organizations, uh, uh, community groups and so forth, that they are actually making sure that this these resources that we've been begging to come to our communities mm -hmm. for years, mm -hmm. that we are actually writing the rules for the application so that we don't end up with the kind of gentrification the brother was talking about worrying about. And we, we all read these stories uh, uh, from Harlem to uh, Oakland about what's happening in these communities. We all know what's going on. And, and we've got to make sure we're creating an entirely new paradigm. And, and I think Mayor Tubbs said something that, that I know Mayor Barack and I know, which we saw as well. Like there, our, our Downtown in Newark uh, used to be in the back in the in the eighties like a ghost town. Right? Mm -hmm. As soon as five o'clock, it was everybody disappeared. Now we have an open tapestry to build an entire community in. And so when you have a mayor sitting up there, Mayor Barack, knowing that this is some of the most valuable land, mm -hmm. we saw, I looked at what happened in Brooklyn. I looked at so I'm going to make sure that we design this in a way that works for our community. And so I'm going to write laws and have not the kind of restrictive zoning that we saw that kept lots of folks out of suburban communities, mm -hmm. but we're going to do a different kind of make sure that we have inclusion of those people. That's what makes sure. So the, the benefit of this program, if it works, and again, I agree, the, the, the initial design of, of Tim Scott and I is very different than, than what's being sort of filtering out. We're all waiting to see these rules. But this is setting up an opportunity for, to push hundreds, hundreds of billions of dollars right. into these communities, and the gatekeepers have got to make sure uh, and I'm not sure if it's going to happen all over the place. Some, I'm sure there's going to be some mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I do think that people, when you have savvy mayors and local leaders like the ones on here, we can design something that works for everyone. Okay. Now, the second question really was going back to the metrics. Uh, how do we raise transparency, um, whether it's from a frontline organization, what can we do, how do we get engaged? And so I'm going to look at to you, Jermaine, and uh, Lisa, you are working with uh, frontline organizations, you're working with folks on the ground. What would your recommendation be in terms of what they can be doing right now as a frontline organization? So one of the things after our first community convening, and I understood about the lack of metrics, um, we began a conversation with our state um, elected officials in the sense of what measures they can put in place to incent opportunity zone funds to be located in the state of Florida, but then also with that incentive, what are some of the um, reporting uh, mechanisms that can be put in place that clearly wouldn't be arduous to, you know, to the respective investors. But that is definitely something that I think on the local and the state level, we're going to really have to pound on and figure out how to make it work. And that's where the voices of the residents, uh, the voices of the lived experiences in those communities is going to have to come into play. 
And the final question really was going down to public education. How do we get the word? I mean, this panel is a perfect example of doing that. But of course, we I'm, I'm from a small town called Thomasville, Georgia, population of 45,000 people. And I can tell you right now, half my town is Opportunity Zone. But I'm pretty sure half, two thirds of my, uh, my members of Providence Missionary Baptist Church don't know about Opportunity Zones. And so one of the questions I'm, I'm I would, uh, and I want to jump out here, how do we make sure that this conversation, because you know, they say knowledge is power. How do we ensure that this knowledge gets down to the literally the darkest places that have not had a light shine on them in a long time? Well, I think part of it, 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 it's complicated, and there's not a lot of tools that make it simple for people. And I say that as someone who spent the last, since last November, mm -hmm. trying to get my head around the, the mm -hmm. legislation and try, mm -hmm. and try to understand it. And I will, and it, even getting to the darkest corners, before that, there's a lot of elected officials I, I, I speak to who have mm -hmm. no idea what it is, and they're supposed to be the gatekeepers and making sure. So I think to the points raised um, earlier, but I'm not sure it's up just to the folks up here to do this, but somebody has to come up with some sort of like easy one page information, infographs, a little movie or something, something that makes it very clear for people what this is, because everyone here doesn't have, everyone doesn't have capital gains, like, everyone doesn't do right. that type yeah. of investing, yeah. so right. I, I think the, even the language is confusing for people, so it's very hard to be an effective advocate, it's very hard to think about what my community looks like when you're speaking about capital gains in 10 years and friends like, okay, what? Like, are you going to build this or not? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so everybody, uh, yeah. respond to that? I, um, well, first of all, I don't want to respond to that. I want to close this out. There you go. And, and so, first of all, I want to thank the panel. We give it one more round of applause for the panel. Uh, and, and, and real quick, I've been to a lot of these things. This is one of the best moderators I have ever been. Yeah. 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 And lastly, Lastly, Micheline is one of my heroes, uh, this incredible African-American female entrepreneur. One of the things that she will tell you is it's all about breaking out of your comfort zones, meeting and networking. So everybody just, where you're sitting, look around you right now. Raise your hand if there's somebody you don't know who's sitting around you. Raise your hand if you don't know. Okay, so do me a favor. Right now, we're going to end this. We're going to end this with this. Everybody's assignment is to shake the hands of somebody you don't know. Ask them what they do. Tell yourself about them. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you.